converted B-17 transport plane carrying 41 US passengers and crew takes off into a foggy Queensland dawn. But a catastrophe is about to happen. For two minutes, the great plane struggles to climb. It's clearly in trouble. And as it tries to return to the airfield, it plunges into a mangrove forest, killing all but one on board. One lucky survivor somehow manages to walk away from the burning wreckage, but 40 others lay dead, leaving heartbroken families thousands of miles away in America. It's sad to think what happened to him. It was a family loss that no one ever got over. To worsen their grief, the authorities hush up the details of the crash, and the family's inquiries are met by a wall of silence. My parents had received a telegram and all it says was that he was killed in the South Pacific. There was, wasn't any detail whatsoever. Witnesses are silenced. They told us, be quiet. Don't talk about it, you know? The Baker's Creek crash was the worst aviation disaster in Australian history, but its cause remains a mystery. Was it engine trouble? Was the plane too heavy? And has a young pilot been wrongly blamed for the tragedy for the last 70 years? It was a perfect storm in terms of what caused that crash. Everything that could possibly go wrong was there. Could an accident like the Baker's Creek disaster happen today? It's still possible for a crew to mismanage a basic situation. Can World War II air crash detective Garth Barnard follow a trail of clues across two continents and finally solve the mystery of the Baker's Creek crash? The bit that's caught my eye is the rash had given the cause of the crash. For the past 20 years, Garth Barnard has been investigating UK World War II air crashes, but today he's on the trail of the Australian Baker's Creek disaster. Until recently, I hadn't even heard of the B-17 crash at Baker's Creek. It was the biggest crash in Australian aviation history. And few people in Australia even know about it or even what happened. Um, the uncertainty about the cause, the mystery that surrounds it, just makes me want to find out more. In the foggy pre-dawn light is US pilot First Lieutenant Vern J. Gidcombe and his co-pilot, Flight Officer William C. Erb, went through their pre-flight checks. 35 American personnel began to board an obsolete B-17 bomber that had been converted into a troop carrier. It had flown so much in combat and had been patched up so many times that the ground crew uh, affectionately referred to it as Old Miss EMF, which stood for every morning fix it. According to one of the crew chiefs, for every 10 hours of flying, it took 10 hours of repair. They were on their way back from a welcome period of rest and recuperation in Australia, far away from the horrors of the war in the Southwest Pacific. After boarding, they tried to make themselves as comfortable as possible on the makeshift plywood floor of the plane. The flight was going to take the mixed services contingent of men from the pretty Queensland town of Mackay on a four and a half hour flight to Port Moresby in New Guinea, where they would return to their frontline duties. Checking his maps and charts at his table in the nose of the aircraft was Navigator Second Lieutenant Jack Ogren. My brother, he was a, a very meticulous type of person. He was well-groomed and uh, he did well in, in high school. And, uh, but he was, uh, I thought, a really, really swell person. Also on board was Staff Sergeant Frankie Welshall. As part of the six-man crew, he had volunteered for the flight as a replacement for its usual crew chief. He was scheduled to come back to the United States and had one more flight that he needed to take in order to get his flight pay, and he took the 
flight because it was the last flight before he was to have left. Last to climb aboard was Corporal Foy K. Roberts. As the final man to embark, he joined the huddle of passengers sitting toboggan style at the feet of the radio operator near the middle of the plane. The flight was now ready to leave and the loading officer, Captain Samuel Cutler, closed the rear door of the aircraft. Because of poor weather, their departure was delayed by 30 minutes to allow the fog to clear. But at precisely 6 a.m., Gidcom eased back the throttles and the four engines of the B-17 powered the heavy plane up into the sky. The flight plan took the plane on two left turns and then back over the airfield to fix its position before heading northwards toward Port Moresby. Two minutes into the flight, and with the aircraft only a few hundred feet off the ground, Gidcom successfully made the first of the two 90-degree turns. But as he completed the second turn, something went wrong. Suddenly, the great plane fell from the sky and crashed into the trees, bursting into flames. All on board were killed. All, that is, apart from Corporal Foy Roberts, who had somehow miraculously survived. It seems amazing to me that a crash of this magnitude has left such little evidence behind. I mean, why is that? Where has all the information gone? I mean, has it been hidden over time or because of the confusion of the war, it wasn't stored correctly? Or has there been some sort of attempt to cover it up? Or I don't know, this just seems to be kept under wraps, a sort of a secret, but I'm determined to find out more. Garth begins his investigation by meeting Robert Cutler. Together with colleagues in Australia, Cutler has created the Baker's Creek Memorial Association, which aims to honor the victims of the tragedy and to track down surviving relatives. Robert's father was Captain Samuel Cutler, the officer who supervised the loading of the flight that morning. It was a wartime diary extract that sparked Robert's interest into the Baker's Creek disaster. What a day and a tragic one. At 6.02 a.m., two minutes after I turned my back on the CBA plane that I had seen just yesterday, it crashed into some woods five miles away and exploded, killing 40 people, with only one saved. Pilot error and poor visibility. As the officer of the day, I put the men on the ship, and so I had a direct part in sealing their fate. Also, I was at the scene of the crash and saw mangled bodies killed while flying at 200 miles an hour. Terrible. How does that make you feel? Well, it was incredible. This is the first time I knew the details of it. When he came back from the war, he didn't talk much about it. He came back three years later after this crash and other things were going on. He was haunted by this notion of closing the door and sealing their fate. Although brief, this is the first account Garth has seen that confirms the time, place, and scale of the accident. But it's not the only piece of evidence Robert has unearthed among his father's possessions. As I understand it from my dad's uh, other papers, uh, two of the men were brought there with military escorts. They were AWOL. And so he had to take one guy off the plane to make room for one more guy to go on the plane. And on the manifest, which you see over here, this is crossed out in pencil. This fellow here, Gilpatrick, was taken off the plane, and another guy was put on, added in pencil. This other fellow, Franklin Smith Jr. This is an official document called an Air Transport Manifest, which my father had to sign as the officer of the day but it lists all the names of the passengers and the crew members. For Garth, this document holds the first tantalizing clue in his investigation. The gross weight recorded for takeoff was 46,810 pounds. Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, clearly stated a weight safety limit of 47,500 pounds for the B-17C model. It wasn't overloaded, but the manifest proves that the plane was very near to its weight limit. Could that have contributed to the disaster?
Before he travels to Australia, Garth wants to discover more about those who died. First, he has to find their families. For many years, researcher C.K. Gailey has worked closely with the Baker's Creek Memorial Association to track down relatives and to tell them more about how their loved ones died. They were exceedingly grateful to find out what happened to their loved one. It's basically giving the family the details of what happened and, and being able to do that is, is a real satisfying thing to do. Using sources such as census information, CK and his colleague, Teddy Hanks, managed to find 38 Baker's Creek relatives, but they were unable to trace the family of navigator Jack Ogren. Enter the age of the internet. Tried to find somebody named Wayne Ogren. I just, you know, in desperation, I put him into the search engine, Google. I just put the name in to see what would happen. And sure enough, years earlier, he had sent an email to a website. And so I sent an email to his email, and I basically said, are you the brother of Jack Ogren who died in World War II? And it couldn't have been, he had to have been on his computer because it wasn't 15 minutes and he came back and he said, why, yes, I am. <laughs> CK traced Jack's brother Wayne to Georgia. Garth followed the trail to find out what Wayne remembers about his brother. Of course, it was a real shock when, when this happened. And all we heard was, you know, at the time was a telegram, you know, no information, just that he was killed in the South Pacific, I think it said. And I found it really hard to accept that. I couldn't believe it, really. And yet I knew it was true, but, I, you know, it was just, didn't want to think about that, you know. Determined to find out more about how her son died, Wayne and Jack's mother had desperately sought answers. And so she connected with some fella about, uh, you know, trying to find out what exactly happened. Well, during the war, the, this fella that was over there when Jack was, uh, couldn't say very much. So there's two letters that I have, one when he was still over there, and then one after he came back to Texas. And of course, the, the letter that uh, came from Texas after he was back in the States, uh, you know, it wasn't censored so much at all, maybe. And so the, the second letter was, uh, you know, told more. She wanted to find out, you know, what really happened. And she did find out some. To me, it was the most wonderful thing that could have happened. But uh, finding out more about my brother. The letters Jack's mother received related the events of that morning, but their author gave no information about the cause. However, at least one other Baker's Creek family was able to discover more. It was that of Staff Sergeant Frank Welchel. Peggy Estes reveals how her family was able to find out more details about the fate of her uncle. I had an uncle who was in Port Moresby waiting for this flight because he knew my uncle was coming in. They had communicated and he knew he was going to be coming in. So he was aware before any of the other family that there had been a crash and that my uncle was on the airplane. But in addition to that, the crew chief who was scheduled to have been on the flight, uh, instead of Frank, I came to visit my grandparents and told them the story of what had happened. His sisters loved him because he was so playful, and every he was the, one of the favorites of the family because he was so fun-loving. It was a family loss that no one ever got over. Before he leaves America, Garth wants to try and understand why the Baker's Creek crash has left such a lasting legacy. At the gates of the Arlington National Cemetery in the USA is the Baker's Creek Memorial, which lists the names of all the young men who died. <laughs>
sitting atop a slab of pink Queensland granite, specially imported from Australia. It's a proud monument resting in one of the most revered locations in the United States, and a powerful reminder that the men who died at Baker's Creek were part of US General Douglas MacArthur's successful defense of Australia against the Japanese. The war at that stage was only just over the hump, if you like, of real fear in the country that they faced an invasion. So it was in the aftermath of 1942, which had been our year of living dangerously, when uh, Japanese advance got well into New Guinea and Australian forces were fighting with their backs to the wall and to a fair degree alone. This little group of uh, uh, soldiers of a whole variety of, uh, of disciplines, if you like, from infantry through to uh, air support, were part of the early phase, if you like, of American commitment to Australia, to the defence of Australia. And so Baker's Creek is another symbol of the sacrifice that both nations have made for each other. It's a symbol of the commitment that the United States made um, to protecting a weaker nation such as Australia. And Australians, um, we just don't forget. You know, we don't forget our friends. By June 1943, more than 120,000 US servicemen were operating under MacArthur in the Southwest Pacific Theater. But what were the 35 men who died at Baker's Creek doing in Mackay? Following a devastating cyclone in 1915, Mackay had been completely redeveloped. The new buildings and infrastructure and the temperate and malaria-free climate convinced the US authorities to use Mackay as a rest and recuperation center for their war-weary men. Speaking in front of Maguire's Hotel, for many of those on the Baker's Creek B-17 spent their last few days. Local historian Berenice Wright explains what the townsfolk of Mackay thought of their friendly invaders. They loved them because they were very smart for, for a start. People had a Hollywoodian idea of what Americans looked like and they certainly lived up to the image. What entertainment was available to the Americans? There was a lot of entertainment available for them. For instance, each day in the paper, they would publish a list of entertainments for the day. It was a column called, What's Cooking at the, at the ARC, the American Red Cross? And what was cooking were um, bus rides to IMEO. They could hire horses, they could hire bicycles and, and ride around the city. They just gave a different aspect. I think that, I get emotional, sorry. That's okay. I think that, that um, people felt that they could do something for these young fellows, as probably was being done for many of their sons overseas too. It was a reciprocation, really. The war was a knife fight, and it was a really awful um, environment, hard, tough, tropical climate. Leave was critical, so these guys you can imagine it, they'd have been in the worst conditions that anyone could be in. They've gone back to Australia. They've had some leave. They've been collected together, put on the plane, and then that accident happens. The horror of the B-17 crash brought a previously remote war home to the people of Mackay. They watched the US military authorities throw a cloak of secrecy over what had happened. Local people were told in no uncertain terms to keep quiet about the crash. The heavy-handed censorship seemed designed to simply wipe it from the records. Generally speaking, the hush-up was not to uh, cover a mess-up. Uh, generally speaking, it was a morale-related issue. And I guess the thought of 40, it's a large number, of 40 men going down, being killed in these circumstances after they'd been on leave, going back to the battlefront from which they'd come. It's not the sort of story that necessarily boosts morale. With so few official records of the disaster, can the crash site itself yield any clues? It lies five miles south of Mackay, and Garth meets local historian Cole Benson there. 
where are we? Is, is this the crash site here? Yeah, this is a crash site here where, where the fuselage came to rest. It uh, took off from over there in a northeasterly direction from where we were. That's Mackay Airport. Then it headed southwest. It took off southwest and did two U turns and then virtually came down through here where it came down through the path and gradually lost altitude from a couple of hundred feet and uh, crashed through the trees and into this area here. It came in at a shallow angle. It didn't nose dive in. And once it hit the ground, of course, it was fully laden with fuel for uh, a four hour trip to Port Moresby. The tail section seems to have leapt over the top of the main wreckage and appears over here, somewhere to my right. And that's where the survivor was found in that tail sec section with, with others who had deceased. We only have two or three photographs of it, and it seems that the, the wreckage, there's not much wreckage shown there, but it ends with a timbered area, as though it was uh, those mangroves over there. So I think we're in the general area as to where it came to rest, determined as best as we can. A 1947 aerial survey photo confirms the exact location as the shape of the impact left by the plane can be clearly seen on the terrain. And with the wreckage so spread out, it would appear he came in low and flat rather than at an angle? Yes, it, it seems like it came in low and flat. And we've got a couple of descriptions of that. A young boy at the time was 14, and he described how he'd come from the creek and suddenly realised he was in the glide path of it as it came, as the the trees gradually got closer and closer to the ground that they'd been chopped off by the, by the aircraft coming down to ground. The evidence from the crash site seems to suggest that the plane made a controlled descent to the ground. While conducting his own research, Col Benson discovered a 1943 Australian police report on the crash. As it was wartime, the police were asked to investigate the possibility that the plane was sabotaged, but this was conclusively ruled out. Can this, the only official report of any kind on the B-17 crash, give Garth any more clues? There's lots of interesting pieces of evidence within the report that give us a clearer picture of uh, actually what went on. And the bit that's caught my eye is they were actually given the cause of the crash. The report offers the opinion of the officer in charge of US aviation at Mackay, Lieutenant Neighbors. Neighbours seems to place the blame on the pilot, as the report states. He considers that the accident was due to the pilots banking the plane at insufficient altitude, the latter being possibly prevented by the fog from observing the nearness of the ground. The only problem I have with taking this at face value is a, there's a bit of conjecture on Neighbours' part. He states earlier in the report that the fog limited his visibility and he was only following the plane by its lights. He was five miles away, so he would never have been able to be certain of the cause. The report seems to rule out engine problems, and three witnesses all said they could see no flames coming from the plane or anything that indicated it was in difficulties. And Garth finds another intriguing clue. A number of the witnesses agree that the plane was brightly illuminated, like he had his landing lights on, but why? If Neighbours' account is to be believed, then surely the pilot knew what height it was at, so he wouldn't have needed to put his lights on. Or maybe it was a sign that he knew he was in trouble and he just put the lights on to, to signal, maybe. The report states it was foggier at the crash site, certainly foggier than what it was on the airfield, so maybe he was using the lights to find somewhere to put down. For many years, the pilot Vern Gidcombe was the man thought to be responsible for the accident. It's easy to see why. Gidcombe had only just taken over the plane from another much more experienced pilot who had returned to the United States. A young, inexperienced pilot loses control of an aircraft, case closed. But were the conclusions drawn by Lieutenant Neighbors and others at the base the main reason Gidcombe got the blame? It's possible but to Garth, the report indicates that Gidcom was fighting a problem on board. Gidcom's B-17 was one of a number of planes that had been pressed into service as air transport of the Allied Air Forces 
The B-17's reuse was a makeshift solution to a simple problem of resources. Very early on in America's role in the war, the, um, the troop carrier groups um, and the, the transport units really had to use a bit of a hodgepodge of aircraft. The transport units were kind of right at the very end of the supply chain without all the support of the infrastructure on, that you would get on the mainland USA. So inevitably they were forced to sort of make do and mend a bit and there are plenty of documented accounts of aircraft being severely battle damaged, being shot up and being patched up and patched up and patched again just to keep them flying. Now inevitably if you do that you're gonna suffer losses, you're gonna suffer problems, big reliability problems. The plane had been worked hard for the previous year in a role for which it was not designed. It was the perfect example of the make-do and mend attitude to the needs of wartime transport. And that brought problems, so was a mechanical issue at the root of the crash. This B-17 had been grounded at the end of May for an engine replacement. Um, they put in a refurbished engine. Um, that one failed uh, during a test. They put another refurbished engine in, and that engine also failed. Eventually, the general in the Air Transport Command instructed that a new engine should be fitted, and uh, everything went fine once that happened. Jeff Cunningham, a Mackay schoolboy at the time, remembers watching the plane flight testing the new engines just two days before the accident. What uh, took our attention this particular Friday that we heard it flying around was that the, uh, the motors didn't sound as though they were synchronised. Uh, you get this variation in sound uh, if they're not synchronised properly. And uh, it appeared to us as, as children that the motor was missing a little bit, or one of them was missing. Perhaps these replacement engines were to blame. Garth's determined to try and piece together the plane's last moments by talking to local witnesses. What can they tell him? Percy Webb was a 15-year-old butcher's delivery boy at the time, and he remembers seeing the B-17 preparing to fly that morning. I was down there and delivered the meat, and a hell of a row going on down there with the aircraft, the, the, the green crew were whatever the engine is up. And uh, I could see the flying portals from where I was, and my strain was flying out of the back of the back bar, you know, a lot of blue smoke around. So that went on for three or four minutes, and it all quietened down. Percy watched as Gidcombe, Erb, Ogren, Welchel, and the others prepared the B-17 for takeoff. He touched it out on the main runway, went down there, went down, down, down to the northeast, southwest runway. He went down there, and he took off. There was no planes flying out the back of a motor. The B-17 continued to climb, but very sluggishly. As the plane rose into a bank of fog, Gidcom and Derb lost sight of the ground. Did they realise they were too low to make their two left turns back to the airfield? The police report indicated that Gidcom realised the danger he was in, because in an attempt to penetrate the mist and fog, he turned the plane's landing lights on. The B-17 now made its second turn to line itself up on a direct course for home. A young Ivan Bragg lived with his parents in a house next door to Baker's Creek. He remembers being woken up as the plane thundered just a few meters above his home. I was asleep in bed at the time, and uh, I heard the noise crash and looked out the window and here's this big flash. It was pretty close. It could have hit the houses. Ivan's father, Arnold, was one of the first men to reach the crash site. There was two men that he's seen that were alive. Uh, one was walking around the days, and he took that person down to the gate to a lady named Mrs. Harris, and she looked after him for that period. Then he come back and he 
tried to find the bloke that was jumping around. And uh, he said there was legs and arms and everywhere and people strung up in trees and, and, uh, and burnt bodies. Sadly, one of the two men Arnold Bragg tried to save died before reaching hospital, but the other, Corporal Foy K. Roberts, had had an amazing escape. Emerging from the wreckage with only superficial injuries, it's thought that he survived because he was cushioned from the impact by the bodies of his comrades. Rudy Sabo was a local farm worker. After hearing the plane come down, he and his fellow workers rushed to the crash site, where they were confronted by the terrible scene. There was a few arms and legs stretched across. Then, of course, I went and had a look at the fuselage, and that's where I seen the bodies. They were all lying head backwards, all facing one way down the tail. 36 of them, about. Couldn't get, they were all stacked. I don't know how anybody down the bottom could have lived anyway. All a big, like two football teams and not a murmur. It give me, it frightened me, you know? See that many young men, not a murmur. I come home and I said to mum, you smell anything mum? She said, no. I said, wash my clothes, I can smell dead men. I went to bed that night, I could still smell it. It wasn't my clothes at all, it was my bloody head. Amid the wreckage, Rudy spotted something that gives Garth another clue. The Yanks loved it. They loved our bully beef. They had a, a box. It must have, it must have held a, a 12 dozen across. It was about four foot high, four foot this way, four foot that way, full to the top. My thoughts then, bloody thing was overloaded. Garth had already found that the B-17 was heavily loaded and nearing its weight-safe operating limits. Could these extra goodies have made the plane unflyable, or at the very least have left no safety margin if an engine problem developed? The evidence from Rudy and the plane's manifest suggests that the loading may have been a problem, and not just the weight, but also the way the load was distributed. Garth learns that aircraft control in flight is sensitive to the location of its center of gravity. It's called a CG. The CG is the point along the center line of the fuselage where the total weight of the flying aircraft would balance if it was simply suspended. A B-17 CG was concentrated around the bomb bay. If too much weight was distributed to the rear, it could have resulted in the plane being tail heavy, meaning that it couldn't climb and that it would stall and crash. A similar picture of events to those witnessed on the ground. And there was another witness who gave her version to the Mercury newspaper some 50 years later. One of those witnesses was then a 17-year-old girl, and the aircraft almost flew over the top of her, and she said that it had flames shooting out from one of the right-hand side engines that almost extended to the tail. And one of the descriptions she made was the scream. She said, had jet engines been around then, it would have sounded like a jet engine. My fellow researcher, Teddy Hanks, during the war had been a, an engine mechanic. And he speculated that possibly a, a hydraulic pump could have failed, which was controlling the pitch. And that the pitch went off and the engine over revved. And there was a radio signal to say that they were turning back. Now, whether they're turning back as a navigational reference or whether they're turning back because they had trouble, there was never any mayday issue. Teddy Hanks believed the engine condition she was describing was what is called a runaway prop a term describing a propeller that breaks loose, resulting in a loss of engine power. On the B-17, sometimes a runaway prop even careered back into the fuselage itself. Armed with so many different theories, Garth has traveled back to America to talk to Reed McCosham of the Commemorative Air Force, a man with many years' experience of flying sentimental journey, the Air Force's very own B-17. Can Reed help answer some of Garth's questions? Reed explains how challenging it must have been for a young, inexperienced pilot to fly. Probably the biggest factor in this airplane is very fatiguing. 
a lot of these older airplanes like this, the, la the loudness, the, you know, the sound and the vibration and the constant monitoring of everything, it, it over a long, long flight, it's going to wear you out. I like to refer to it as a dump truck with wings. Just very stable. Got to manhandle it around when you want it to move, when you want to put it somewhere. If the plane was a handful to fly under normal circumstances, how did it behave with an engine out? If we just lose one engine on takeoff, we just climb out at, at, at the same speed. So uh, it, it's you're just going to climb a little slower, but other than that, it's going to be uh, not not that big of a factor now. So if you're light enough, you can you can fly around with two engines. Uh, well, probability of losing both engines. About the only reason I could see for that is either you forgot to put gas in them, or uh, or somehow one exploded big enough that somehow it damaged the other one and, and, and disabled it. Uh, so it's going to be pretty rare. Losing two engines right at, at takeoff, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a little tougher to get through. But yeah, it uh, comes down to weight, uh, temperature, performance, aircraft performance, things like that. If you say had a, an aircraft like this that was converted to, say, a passenger aircraft, would that change the center of gravity and would that the characteristics of the plane completely different by doing that? Uh, you know, it changes it a little. Again, that's a very stable aircraft. Uh, you can move the center of gravity quite a bit in this without having any uh, large effect on it. As they land, Garth considers the conflicting evidence from witnesses about the engine fires. Reed thinks he has an explanation for what the witnesses may have seen. All right, right here is our wastegate. And as that closes, when we use the turbos for takeoff, it forces the exhaust out this turbine wheel here. And so a big flame would shoot down here well, under pressure from the exhaust. And it's, uh, it's and this glows red. And it's, uh, it's quite a sight at night. And this would be used for takeoff? take off uh, at high altitudes and we can turn them on for landing in case we have to go around and we need a lot of boost. It's just to maximize the engine output, give us much more horse or maximum horsepower. So if someone's never seen these flames before, they're not familiar with this type of aircraft and they saw this in the, in the sky, what, they would presume perhaps the engine was on fire? They could. If you just saw it from one angle, um, if you saw the plane head on or if it went right over top of you, you'd see all four of them doing it. But maybe if you're over on just one side of the airplane, you probably only see these two. Uh, so that might give you a feeling that they could be on fire. Garth's flight on the B-17 has answered some questions, but also raised new ones. If it's possible that the fire seen by witnesses were flames from the turbochargers, could engine trouble still have been a problem, given that the sound of a runaway prop was heard? Garth has sent all the evidence he's gathered in Australia and America to air safety expert Gary Wan to get his view of what happened. Calling on his 30 years of aviation experience, Gary begins by discounting one of the possible causes. There was a suggestion the aircraft wasn't properly loaded and that centre of gravity wasn't in the right place and it may have been tail heavy. If the centre of gravity of the aircraft had been um, such that it was tail heavy, as soon as the aircraft got airborne, the nose would have risen quite rapidly and the pilots would have struggled um, pushing forward on the control column to lower the nose of the aircraft. And this would have been quite apparent um, from the witnesses. They would have seen the aircraft nose go up and then it would have tended to fall, um, possibly uh, falling to the left or right on one wingtip. Did Gary think the crew were in any way to blame? There was some fog, a little bit of haze around, and certainly once the, the pilots got airborne, they may have had um, issues where they couldn't quite see where the horizon was, and that could have led, led to disorientation. Um, certainly um, in the turn, if the pilot had lost his horizon, he may have turned more steeply than he intended. When an aircraft turns, the speed it needs to fly at to maintain flight will increase. So if the aircraft was just at flying speed, by turning and banking the aircraft, either left or right, the aircraft would have needed to be flying a little bit faster. If it wasn't flying at that speed, um, in this case, when the aircraft turned, it would have lost height as it turned, effectively stalling in the turn. Poor piloting skills could have been an issue, but Gary thinks the real answer lies in a combination of factors. Any accident that you look at, usually there's not one single thing that causes the accident. And um, 
you talk about the Swiss cheese effect, where all the holes in the cheese come into alignment at the same time. The accident may have been caused by, by a number of uh, different uh, factors. Um, it probably wasn't helped by the fact that it was only just light. Um, there was uh, a little bit of fog around. There may have been um, some loss of power from the engines, bearing in mind the aircraft has been serviced. It was an old aeroplane and it was heavily loaded. So possibly it could be all these factors that contributed to the accident. Once again, the Swiss cheese effect. Facing a problem during takeoff is among a pilot's worst fears. Former RAF and commercial test pilot Chris Roberts explains how, 70 years after the Baker's Creek disaster, pilots must still carefully plan for the same runway emergencies today. Before you go to the aeroplane, you do all of the calculations to find out what is what we call the most critical point, which is a distance down the runway, and at that point you can either fly or stop. And at that point you have a speed, which is called V1. At V1 you make the decision positively because if you've had an engine failure before V1, you have to stop. If you have an engine failure after V1, you have to fly. If you have had an engine failure, you will fly to another pre-calculated speed called V2, which is the planned climb speed optimally for a single engine failure situation. So the whole procedure is prepared for. These days, the human error has been eliminated by operational procedure. I say eliminated, you can't always eliminate because there will always be the human factor. So it's still possible these days for a crew to mismanage a basic situation like an engine failure and end up in an unfortunate situation. Back home after his investigations in the US and Australia, what has Garth concluded about what happened at Baker's Creek? After receiving Gary's analysis, it pretty much sums up my own thoughts on the accident. Garth believes that the heavily loaded B-17 suffered some kind of engine failure just after takeoff. With one, if not two, problem engines, the plane simply wasn't able to climb. During the drama that followed, poor visibility prevented the inexperienced Gidcom and Erb from having visual references with which to judge their two turns back to the safety of the airfield. With already insufficient engine power, the turns further reduced the speed of the B-17. The result was the eventual stall and crash of the aircraft. The two young pilots were put in an impossible position on that misty morning. The switched on landing lights suggest they knew they were in trouble and were trying their very best to put down at the earliest moment. Personally, I think the crew did the very best they could with the situation that they were put in. We do not have all the evidence or the facts. And because of that, the definitive cause of the crash will always remain a mystery. The tireless work of the Memorial Association continues to shed some light on the Baker's Creek disaster. Lynn Tobin was trying to find a picture of the father that she never met when she walked into the Baker's Creek story. I had no idea whatsoever that my brother Jack had, had fathered a, a child. I think my first question was who in the family was left-handed? <laughs> Turns out a lot of them were. <laughs> And then it, it was fun to see the pictures of, of Jack. And it, nice to learn about um, my birth father. It sort of gives you a, you know, who, who am I, where do I come from? When I first saw her, I said, you are an ogren, no doubt about it. She's our niece, my niece. And we love her a lot. <laughs>